Assalamu alaikum, hello, and welcome to the final uh, Patient with Headaches webinar. My name is Gerard Moore, and I am the technical support manager for today. Uh, the, web, uh, the date is the 3rd of November 2020, and the time is just past 7 p.m. here in the UAE. Uh, the webinar today is Women's Health and Headache and Migraines, and it will be led by Dr. Suzanne Nori. But before I uh, hand over to the chairman, I would like to say that uh, this is our, our last uh, headache webinar. Thank you all for joining. They will be put up, posted live on dramashatila.com, all free of charge and accessible uh, to use uh, from uh, next week onwards. The webinar is being recorded. Uh, and will be available on playback in the next four days as well on the same link that you have. If you have any audio or technical issues, you can press the red reconnect button that is located at the top of your screen and that will automatically resynchronize your computers. Uh, and if you wish to ask any private questions, um, you can press the admin only button and it will come straight to me as the administrator. I now like to hand you over one last time uh, to Dr. Amir Shatila, well, for the time being anyway, uh, consultant neurologist at SSMC, for the official opening of today. Dr. Ahmed, floor is yours. Thank you, Jared, for the kind introduction. First of all, good evening, good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you all, as Jared had mentioned, to our final headache webinar and the final webinar for this series of patient webinars that we have done over the past couple of months. Hopefully we'll come back in the next month or two with a, with new series and new lectures. Please feel free to, if you have any ideas or any topics that you'd like to learn more about, please feel free in the chat bar to, to drop a line. We will definitely uh, try to accommodate. Uh, today I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Eli, Eli Lilly, for uh, hosting this, for sponsoring this webinar. I would like to thank uh, SSMC for hosting the webinar, and finally Gerard from Focus Golf for organizing the webinar. Today we have with us Dr. Suzanne Nuri. She is a neurology consultant at University Hospital in Sharjah, and she's going to talk to us today about migraine and women's health. So without further ado, Dr. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much for all the audience for joining us uh, for this evening. For Dr. one Sweden, of the can switch your video camera on, please, if you wish. Okay. On you, or off? Uh, it's uh, up to you, as you wish. It's off now, if you wish to leave it, it off. Is, it is off now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, no yeah, problem. Okay. All right, okay. So um, we're going to talk today, today this evening about uh, migraine and women in different stages of their life cycle because we know that migraine headache is strongly influenced by reproductive events that occur throughout the lifespan of women. And each of these reproductive events has a different hormonal milieu which might modulate the clinical cause of uh, migraine headache uh, in, in these women. So. Um, I need to put the disclosure, but I have nothing to disclose. Our topic this evening, we're going to cover migraine prevalence and characteristics throughout uh, the female life cycle and the factors to consider in the treatment of females with migraine during menstrual periods, pregnancy and menopause. And then we will discuss migraine and the risk of stroke. I just need to move this. So what is migraine? Migraine is a brain disease, most common of the disabling primary headaches, the most common reason for referral to neurologists. And of those who seek headache treatment from their healthcare professional, more than 90% of these patients meet diagnostic criteria for migraine, yet the majority do not receive a correct diagnosis and not receive a correct treatment. And when patients with chronic migraine consult their physicians, who is not a neurologist or headache specialist, only 16% receive a correct diagnosis. And that's why we believe migraine remains underrecognized and underdiagnosed in our everyday clinical practice. 
So this table shows the international criteria, international classification of headache disorders the criteria for the diagnosis of migraine. Migraine is an episodic recurring headache that lasts four hours to 72 hours and has the following criteria. With any two of the following regarding quality, moderate to severe pain, pulsatile or throbbing, unilateral and uh, or increased by movements. And with one or both of the following regarding the symptoms, nausea or vomiting or both, increased sensitivity to light, that is photophobia, increased sensitivity to sound or noise, and that is phonophobia. And some people also, they have sensitivity to smell, we call it osmophobia. However, not all pain, uh, not all pain of migraine is throbbing pain. Some patients have a steady pain or dull pain in most, in almost half of their patients. And not always uh, pain is unilateral. It can be bilateral in 60% of patients. And vomiting occurs only in one third of patients, but nausea is common and it occurs in around 70% uh, of patients. How are people with migraine different? People with migraine are described to have a sensitive brain. There is a huge genetic component in the etiology of migraine. So the evidence suggests that migraine is an inherited problem of ion channels in the brain. And the brain of people with migraine, or uh, we call them a migraineer, their brain lacks the ability to adapt to strong sensory stimulation, like what we normally happens for a normal person. But in their case, the strength of the stimulus continues to grow and build up until migraine crisis occur. Unfortunately, migraine is very common in children, and it has been reported that in kids as young as 18 months old, and about 10% of school-age children suffer from migraine as well, and up to 28% of adolescents between the ages 15 and 19 years are affected by migraine. And half of all migraine sufferers have their first attack before the age of 12. And here we have some facts. Migraine begins earlier in males, and migraine with aura begins earlier than migraine without aura. Before puberty, uh, before puberty boys suffer from migraine more often than girls. As adolescence approaches, the incidence increases more rapidly in girls than in boys. We have studies from Stewart and his team reported that the peak incidence of migraine was 12 to 13 years of age for girls experiencing migraine with aura and 14 to 17 years of age for those experiencing migraine without aura. And thus, migraine with uh, uh, migraine without aura most commonly begins after the onset of menarche, while migraine with aura usually begins shortly before or at the time of menarche and that is the start of puberty. By the time they turn 17, as many as 8% of boys and 23% of girls have experienced a migraine at least once. Let's see now migraine in women. Women suffer migraines three times more common than men. And worldwide, roughly one-fourth of reproductive uh, age women have migraine. And as we mentioned earlier, migraine headaches are likely influenced by the different hormonal milieu encountered during reproductive life events. That begins during menarche and continues throughout until menopause. This hormonal environment might, might modulate the clinical cause of migraine headache. Estrogen, a predominant female sex hormone, is of particular interest. It is thought that estrogen levels are likely the key factor in the increased prevalence of migraine in women. And we have evidence. Migraine prevalence increases at menarche and at the onset of menstruation during puberty, especially migraine without aura. Estrogen withdrawal during menstruation is a common trigger of our migraine. And migraine decreases during the second and third trimester of pregnancy. And when estrogen levels are high, migraines are common immediately postpartum with the precipitous drop in the uh, estrogen level. Estrogen administration 
as oral contraceptive pills and hormone replacement therapy can also trigger migraines. So, and migraine generally improve with physiologic or physiological uh, menopause, while medically induced menopause worsens headache without adding estradiol. Uh, if it's added, it will improve the headache attacks. Okay, so just let me move one more slide. And although the association between migraine and sex hormones has been repeatedly demonstrated, the exact pathophysiology of this association has not yet been fully elucidated. However, fluctuation in the serum estrogen may be very important and may account for the migraine occurrence. So, what is the effect of fluctuations of estrogen levels? Fluctuation of estrogen can cause changes in the prostaglandin release, and we will see how this can affect migraine in a short, uh, short time. Fluctuations of estrogen levels also affects prolactin release. It affects opioid regulations and melatonin secretion, and it, it causes also changes in the neurotransmitter, different neurotransmitters in the brain. As we mentioned, menstruation is a potent migraine trigger. So menstrual migraine has recently been defined by the International Headache Society in the appendix of their diagnostic criteria for headache. It has been divided into two subcategories. We have menstrually related migraine without aura, and we have pure menstrual migraine without aura. The criteria for menstrually related migraine without aura include, it's a predictable migraine attacks occurring during the pre perimenstrual time period, that is two days before to three days after the onset of menstruation. Migraines also occur at other times of the month, and the association with, with menses must be confirmed in at least two out of three menstrual cycles. So this is a migraine without aura, occurs during uh, menstruation and outside menstruation. While pure menstrual migraine without aura is similar to the above criteria, except that migraine headaches do not occur at other times of the menstrual cycle. Regarding the severity, menstrual attacks are up to four times more likely to be severe than uh, uh, migraine in other, other parts or other sites, uh, other times of the month. Uh, it is more to be associated with nausea and vomiting, and it is more to be uh, resistant to abortive uh, non-medications. Regarding pathophysiology of menstrual migraine, I'm not going to go into details of that. It is thought that estrogen withdrawal prostaglandin release and, and the magnesium deficiency during late luteal and early follicular phases will stimulate both excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters leading to the changes that increase vulnerability to menstrual migraine. Prostaglandins are released into the systemic circulation by shedding endometrium during the perimenstrual time period, secondary to withdrawal of uh, progesterone. So there are several evidence suggests that prostaglandin release plays a role in the pathophysiology of menstrual migraine. First, migraine-like headaches can be triggered by injections of prostaglandin E2 in non-migraineurs. Second, serum taken from women during menstruation and later infused back to them at a later time can induce headache and a migraine-like headache. Third, Medication that are prostaglandin inhibitors have been used to prevent menstrual migraine. So how, how do we manage menstrual migraine? For the acute attacks, we use acute therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, or triptans of different kinds. Mini prophylaxis is starting 48 hours before expected headache or 10 days after the ovulation and continuing up to one week. Doses should be increased. Uh, of the usual prophylaxis. This is also one method of how to treat menstrual migraine. We can also use naproxen and we can use triptans. Hormonal prophylaxis may be helpful, and for especially for hormonally triggered migraine and that do not respond to other treatments. And this can be used in conjunction with other treatments as well. A hormonal agent is prescribed for only a few days in each cycle. 
The best example for this is estradiol gel, 1.5 milligram once daily, applied for seven days, beginning 10 days after ovulation and continued through the second day of menstrual bleeding. Estradiol in small doses have been tried, but it was not effective. So the dose is the recommended dose is 1.5 milligram. Estradiol patch of 100 microgram also can be used for four days during the uh, period or the during expected time to have headaches. This table shows the most commonly used drugs for menstrual-related uh, migraine. Magnesium is also helpful as low brain magnesium levels have been reported in at least 80 studies involving uh, migraine headache patients. Gonadotrophin releasing hormone antagonists like the one that's used for in, uh, infertility can eliminate pure uh, menstrual related migraine, but they may also cause adverse, effect, uh, adverse effects of estrogen deficiency limiting the duration of their use, and they should not be used for more than six months. Hysterectomy is not recommended for management of menstrual migraine. So what about the effect of oral contraceptive pills on migraine? Migraines may occur for the first time following oral contraceptive pill use, and aura may develop for the first time after the use of uh, OCPs, the effect of oral contraceptive pills on migraine is quite variable. We have 50% headache unchanged, and 30% headache can worsen, and in about 6% it might improve. So patients with aura are more likely to worsen. This is reported in most, uh, almost 50% of patients. The effect of uh, oral contraceptives of migraine with aura, uh, as we just mentioned, migraine with aura are more likely to worsen uh, with the use of oral contraceptive pills. Visual, sensory, and motor aura may develop for the first time after the use of oral contraceptive pill. And some patients with new onset aura or a crescendo pattern after the start of oral contraceptive pill have progressed to develop ischemic stroke. So we now see the risk of a stroke in patients with migraine and those uh, using oral contraceptive pills. Past studies have reported an increased risk of stroke or CVAs in patients with migraine headache, especially young women with migraine with aura. A risk for stroke associated with oral contraceptive pills vary with different doses of estrogen in, uh, in their contents. Recent studies have not uh, shown an increased risk of a stroke in women who use low estrogen doses of oral contraceptive pills. Oral pills containing only progesterone do not increase the risk of a, stro of a stroke and they are quite safe and can be used. So we have also recent meta-analysis reviewed 14 studies. 11 cases controlled and 11 and uh, three cohort studies to determine the relationship between migraine at the risk of ischemic stroke. So the approximate incidence of ischemic stroke per 100,000 women per year in women with and without migraine who do not use oral contraceptive pills is as follows. In a younger age group of less than 34, risk of a stroke in patients without migraine is only 1.3 per 100,000. This increases to almost four times if a woman suffers migraine without aura and eight times if has migraine with aura. For older age group, that is above 35, 35 uh, up to 44, incidence of stroke without migraine is 3.6. It is tripled in patients with migraine without aura and almost six times when the migraine uh, occurs with aura. This is just a repetition of what I have been mentioning, but the only point that to add is smoking increases the risk of a stroke. So the risk is additive. We have the relative risk at 35 if a woman with migraine with aura on oral contraceptive pill and also a smoker. So it is advisable that patients with migraine with aura should not uh, smoke. So who can use oral contraceptive pills? 
there is no absolute contraindication for the use of oral contraceptive pills. And most women with migraine without aura and those with auras, such as visual symptoms lasting less than one hour, can also use uh, oral contraceptive pills safely. And who should not use oral contraceptive pills? Women with complicated oral symptoms, such as hemiparesis or dysphagia or prolonged focal neurological symptoms and signs lasting for more than one hour should avoid low-dose estrogen oral contraceptive pills. Oral contraceptive pills should be avoided also in patients who smoke, as we just mentioned, and especially if there is aura. Stop or switch if aura develops uh, or increase our, uh, if, if aura develops or increase or if headache worsens after the first few weeks. And this is advice that we should give to all females uh, using contraceptive pills. Now we'll see a migraine during pregnancy and postpartum. We have to emphasize that migraineers do not have an increased risk of miscarriages, pregnancy toxemia, congenital anomalies, or stillbirth. They can uh, get pregnant safely. We have to be vigilant and look for the life-threatening causes of headache that can occur during pregnancy as well. More serious conditions like preeclampsia, eclampsia, subarachnoid hemorrhages, intracerebral hemorrhage, and especially cerebral vein thrombosis. These are all considered as red flags, especially during pregnancy, and we should not consider uh, migraine occurring for the first time is uh, just a migraine. Pre-existing migraine most often improves with pregnancy. Up to 80% improved during the second, especially during the late second and late trimesters. Several studies have reported new onset visual, sensory, and motor auras during pregnancy. And some patients with past history of migraine without aura may experience aura for the first time during pregnancy as well. Patients with exclusively migraine with aura are less likely to have any improvement in their migraine during pregnancy. So management of migraine during pregnancy, it's a bit complicated. There is no medication, there's a non-medication approach is usually the advised. Avoidance of triggers should be the, the main uh, advice that we give to patients. They can use ice, good night sleep, and uh, biofeedback. Symptomatic medications, acetaminophen, paracetamol, this FDA class B drug. Caffeine in small doses can be safe or less than 300 milligrams per day. It's also considered like class B and safe. Codeine in reasonable amounts, they can just say small doses, is also uh, probably safe during pregnancy. However, triptans should be avoided during pregnancy. And the ideal choice for of triptan during pregnancy, if at all needed, is sumatriptan. Uh, sumatriptan administered either by the nasal delivery system or by nasal spray. And we prefer this for two reasons. They deliver maternal serum concentrations that uh, are equivalent to or less than 25 milligram sumatriptan tablet. That's quite a small dose. And parental administration maintains efficacy in the presence of gastric stasis or nausea. To prevent medication overuse headache, triptans are usually limited to around nine days per month. Preventive medications during pregnancy, uh, preventive of choices, we have beta blockers, we have uh, calcium channel blocker verapamil, both are safe during pregnancy. Topiramate, considered class C, should only be used if the benefits outweigh the risks. Antidepressants may be considered in some cases. Valproic acid, of course, to be avoided because it is class D. During menopause, WHO defined the time period two to eight years before menopause plus one year as perimenopause, during which menstrual cycles vary, becoming heavier, bleeding becoming heavier, cycles are unevolutory and with intermittent amenorrhea. Levels of ovarian hormones may differ. Progesterone becomes low. 
In some cross-sectional studies, also contribute to the increased frequency of migraine. However, most women will see improvement in their migraine once they enter the established menopause. Uh, however, most women, as we mentioned, they will have improvement in their migraine once they have a menopause, and two-thirds of women with prior migraine improve with physiological migraine. Contrast contrastingly, surgical menopause results in worsening of migraine in another two-thirds of cases, and that's likely caused by abrupt withdrawal of estrogen, a surgical ophrectomy may be more provocative. Another potential explanation may be that the dose of estrogen replacement therapy used for surgically ophrectomy was too low to prevent migraine, and that was found in some of these studies. Hormone replacement therapy, HRT, is given to perimenopause and menopausal women to prevent drops in estradiol, to produce anovulation, and to add estrogen or progesterone that may have preventive effect. HRT initiated in the perimenopause is not associated with any increased risk of uh, stroke. Menopausal hormonal therapy that is, HRT can be used with certain caveats, and it is not contraindicated in postmenopausal women with migraine with or without aura. And for women with history of menstrual related migraine, administration may be through the transdermal uh, preparations, as we mentioned earlier, in the lowest doses, but sufficient to meet uh, treatment goals. HRT can improve migraine in about 20%, 23%. It can worsen migraine in a similar percentage, 20%, and it leaves unchanged in the majority of patients. Oral symptoms can develop secondary to estrogen replacement therapy in some patients. To uh, summarize and conclude, migraine is more prevalent in women, mostly at the reproductive age. Ovarian steroid hormones, especially estrogen, play a major role in migraine, but often in unpredictable way. And hormonal influences during reproductive life cycle affect not only the frequency and the severity of migraine, but also its treatment. Hormonal manipulation strategies aimed at, min at eliminating or minimizing decreases in estrogen levels may prevent migraine attacks. And although steady or increasing levels of estrogen may reduce the risk of migraine, like in pregnancy and menopause, acute migraine attacks may be triggered by significant drops in the estrogen levels. Healthcare professionals caring for women throughout their life, they should be familiar with uh, these sex-based differences in women with migraine and with targeted strategies for management. Unfortunately, neurologists are not trained to train uh, menstrual-related migraine and hormonal-related migraines. And unfortunately, the gynecologists are not dealing with any hormonal-related neurological issues. So standard therapy to abort acute attacks of migraine and preventive therapies should take into account hormonal milestones as well as other coexisting disease. And with this, I would thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Suzanne, for the very educational lecture Thank you. on hormones and migraine uh, among women. Uh, it was interesting that you had mentioned about the oral contraceptive uh, dose because there was an article I was reading about once that mentioned that if women do complain about migraines during the use of oral contraceptive pills, there, potentially you could try to decrease the dose of estrogen. Yes. Definitely. But, that, but that comes with a caveat in the sense that it may increase uh, spotting uh, premenstrual. So you have the idea that you may reduce your migraines, but you may increase spotting and may also increase your risk of the hormones not working. So I think that's a delicate balance as well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we have to balance this because... Uh, uh, 
just getting uh, getting the migraine or just getting a spotting, I think is more tolerated by women rather than having the headache and migraines. Yeah. Got it. Do Dr. Susan, are you able to turn your video camera on for the questions and answer session? If well, uh, yeah, just give me one second. I will. <clears throat> Yes, I'm here. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, as you had mentioned that there's the hormonal issues that may play a role in migraine, especially during pregnancy. But I think a lot of people, sometimes they forget about the other triggers that may be causing migraines. You know, your diet, your lack of exercise, your sleep that may be affected during pregnancy, all of which, although yes, we may not have a lot of pharmacologic treatments for migraines. There are still other things, a lot of other things people can try that may improve their quality of life if they suffer from migraines. Yeah, that's why we always advise that just to, to avoid the triggers. So this is the treatment that we look for rather than just go for the pharmacological therapies. Exactly. Hmm. Very nice. And it looks like questions are starting to come in. I will ask, there's a question from Sally Osman. Yeah. I have a lot of headaches throughout my cycle. Are, the, are these called rebound headaches and how to stop them? Okay, so thank you for the question. We don't call it rebound headache, but we call it, if you're only getting these headache attacks during migraine only, so, or uh, at other times of the month, we call it menstrual related migraines especially if it is, if it is repeated uh, in other cycles as well. And uh, if this is a question, if you call it rebound, it's not a rebound headache. But of course, treatment of uh, menstrual related migraine, as we just mentioned, you can try the magnesium, you can try naproxen, you can try increase your, uh, the usual prophylaxis that you are using in other days. Or if things are not, not still under control, you can try some uh, hormonal preparation as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question uh, from Noura, Noura Abdullah. Should I stop migraine medications while breastfeed? Yeah. It, it depends which, breast med which uh, migraine medication you're using because uh, some of these are classified as class uh, C and D. So, um, they are not all safe and if you're talking about the prophylaxis medication or acute therapy medications I think we always have alternatives yes. if you mention the drug that you're using we can tell you which one you can take or which one you can stop yes definitely because some medications you can't take if you're breastfeeding because okay. even though the quantity of medication in the breast milk may be small it may still be enough to cause trouble so it's important to know what medication you're taking. And most of this medication is secreted into breast milk. Okay, because they got to cross the blood-brain barrier anyways to mm -hmm. relieve the migraine. So if they can cross the blood-brain barrier, they can cross through breast milk, which is again, very, very fattening, high in fat. So there's an affinity for that. Sure. What is the relationship, this is from, Ashik Hassan Kawusa, what is the relation of migraine with epilepsy and coronary syndrome? Migraine, epilepsy, and? Coronary syndrome. Is there a relation that you know of? Because No. The I, there is a relation. If we talk, we're talking about uh, menstrual cycles are about uh, different uh, events in the woman's cycle. There is a relation between menstruation and epilepsy. There is a yes. there is a relation between menstruation and a migraine, but I'm not sure about the relation between epilepsy, migraine, and Crohn's syndrome now. Yes, no idea. I can't think of the epilepsy and migraine. Uh, epilepsy and menstruation, there's definitely catamenial epilepsy. Yes, exactly. And migraine with menstruation, you spent the last thirty minutes talking about it. But I don't know how we can put all three together. Maybe more clarification on that question. Uh, this is a question from Hala. Can antidepressants prevent migraines? And 
they can. Yes, of course, yeah. And Actually, the, the, the group of medication that we use as a preventive for, mig for migraine, one of the group of the, these medications is antidepressants. And so we use it a lot and we used to use it a lot. Maybe now we have other anti-CGRP and others, but still we, we use it in some patients if there is any uh, comorbid condition that's indicating using antidepressant. Exactly. And one of and one medication that I tend to use that I have relatively good results are the tricyclic antidepressants, but yes. you have to weigh the side effects versus exactly. the headache benefit. So they're not clean drugs. They do work, but you may get the side effects may be intolerable or unbearable for some people. Yes. But they do work sometimes. A smaller doses, they are fine. I don't feel I don't find many people who complain of the side effects of the dryness of the mouth and others in small doses. For me, it's the it's the sedation. I try to I try to have them take it at night, but some people seem to be extremely sensitive. Even when I go with like you know Pamelor or Elevil, imatriptyline, even like a twenty five milligram at bedtime, they'll be like, I feel I feel drugged up all day long, and I'm like. That's Sometimes a, I start with the 10 milligram. Okay. Yeah. So, or just half tablet of the 25. So. Uh, and play with that and go from there. Especially if the patient is having problems sleep. So that if they have a problem of uh, getting sleep at night. So this is the best that <clears throat> you can use. And that's where I think where we sometimes try to find where we use the side effect of one medication that helps treat the issues from another problem. You have insomnia. <laughs> we try to capitalize on the effect that this drug may make you sleepy okay. or if you have high blood pressure beta blocker would be a great drug to use or a calcium okay. channel blocker true okay. and what is the class of antidepressants used for migraines uh Manahil, we had just mentioned this uh tricyclics antidepressants are a class um uh, i don't know if there's can we use do you use some Balta for our duloxetine for migraines sometimes or? Sometimes, yes, if there is any, because sometimes migraine is associated with depression. So we use the Balta. Because if, if, you, if you improve the depression, you may also improve the migraines as well. Right, right. So the question about the tricyclic depression class. So uh, I, I, don't get, I don't get the question. So what do you mean by the class? Or the tricyclic antidepressants, right? It's what is the class of antidepressants used for migraines? The class of antidepressant. Yeah, I don't know if they're considering like you know SSRIs as a class, the SNRIs oh, right. as another class. It's a tricyclic. That's which is a little bit of everything. That's how I understood the question. Yeah, okay. But if if you would like any further clarification, uh, Menahid, please feel free to. Drop a line and we could try to answer that later on. Uh, there is a question. I hope I'm saying the name correct. Bikash Shinadra Mundan. I hope I said your name correct. Which group of medications are safe during menopause women's? Your suggestions for treatment of migraines. Group of medications for what? For prophylaxis or for acute therapy? Doesn't clarify. We can say so for a menopausal period, uh, all the uh, acute medicines can be tried. Triptans is safe, can be used. There's no problem with that. We only say that triptan should not be used during pregnancy, but otherwise during menopause, it's fine, can be used. This is for acute therapy. All uh, non-steroid and anti-inflammatory can be used. For the prophylaxis, also the choice is open, so they can use any of these unless there is a comorbidity that is uh, contraindicating that kind of uh, group of uh, medicine to be used in that individual. Like for patients with cardiac problems, we don't go for the tricyclic antidepressants. Okay, so, yeah. And we also yeah. avoid the tryptans for people with any coronary exactly. artery disease. Exactly. exactly, because of the vasoconstriction, yeah. Exactly. People with bronchial asthma, we go, don't go for the beta blockers. Beta blockers. So we, yeah, so we have to find out or to know the comorbidities of the patients before prescribing uh, any any group of medications. Exactly, that's true. Yes. One thing that I, I know that sometimes we're limited a lot by the treatment of migraines, especially in, in pregnant uh, women who are pregnant, especially in the first trimester. 
Uh, I've noticed sometimes magnesium oxide, 400 milligrams twice a day, tends to do wonders. I mean, when it works, it's like magical. Yes. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I've noticed mag, not, mag oxide does get does get you some good relief from migraines, especially in the first trimester. We are using it during pregnancy and outside pregnancy. So magnesium really does wonder. True. And it's, and it's a relatively clean medication. It's a supplement. Yeah, There's not a lot of side effects. So exactly. it works. Uh, how do antidepressants work for migraine? This is asked by Manahil. Uh, that is... I don't know. I don't know if we know that. I, I don't... Unless it's treating your mic, your depression per se, I don't know how how the different neurotransmitters when you put them all together, how yeah. that helps with migraines. Unless you know of anything. Yeah, it's not only for the tricyclic depressants. I think it's also I don't know exactly what's the mechanism of action and how it affects the neurotransmitters, as you mentioned. Not only for the tricyclic depressant. We know about the newer medications definitely how they work about the anti-CGRP, how they work, we know that. But about anti-epileptic, how it works and how it affects the neurotransmitters, about antidepressants, anti-hypertensives, anti-arrhythmic, I have no idea. That's true, like, you know, a medication like Topamax or, or valproic acid, which are very good for migraines. Uh, how do they, very good for epilepsy, but and also migraines, how do they work? I don't I, I, think, I, I think they should work or be, they are working through stabilizing the channels because we say that migraine is uh, some channel, iron channel problem. So it may be stabilizing the channels. Or the okay. Maybe. Yeah. And Noura is asking, what is the safest medication for migraine for a person who's breastfeeding? Again, I think you had, depending if it's prophylactic or or preventative, mag oxide is probably the safest. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just go for magnesium, yeah. Magnesium. Mm -hmm. How important is stress in migraine by Sally Osman? Uh, stress. Stress in migraines. One of the very strong trigger for uh, uh, migraine. I agree. Oh, and that's the thing, you know, it's not just one, it's not like migraine. And we had a webinar a couple a couple of lectures back about migraine and depression. It's, oh. they, they're not two different illnesses. I mean, migraines can cause depression. Your depression can worsen your migraines. And it's not so much that you just, you don't treat each one separately. Sometimes if you just treat the depression, your migraines may improve. You treat your migraines, your depression may improve. And they're, they're mixed like they're that. Very interesting. Actually, uh, during my presentation, there was some part about the burden of migraine and the, uh, the impact of migraine on individuals. But because of the time, I removed that part. But definitely, migraine can, uh, it has a big burden on individual with uh, uh, impact his uh, quality of life. Uh, especially for women, because as we mentioned, that migraine is quite common in women. And it's, the impact is not only during the attacks, we have also the inter-attacks, in between the attacks. So always the individual will be looking that he will be afraid that he will get the attack during any functions. So they are avoiding socializing, they are avoiding going out. Always they have their medicine in their uh, pocket or in their purse. So. Um, and it's always, uh, always, we have to look if there is an underlying depression or if there is any problems, a comorbidity, let's say not underlying only. So it's a comorbid, uh, comorbid depression because it makes the migraine worse and it also affects the, uh, the response to treatment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Ashik Hussain Kawusa uh, had clarified the question that he asked previously. Are patients with migraines more prone to have epilepsy and vice versa? I think we had mentioned this, that we know that people with epilepsy can have breakthrough seizures during menstruation. And we know that migraines can have a, can be triggered by hormone changes. So theoretically, both of them can kind of, I don't think if they cause each other, but you can definitely have them both at the same time. 
one interesting thing that if you do an EEG for patients with migraine, you can some you can find some abnormalities in the EEG, but that doesn't mean that patients with migraine have seizures. Okay. And I always say this: there's some link between migraine and epilepsy. Treatment of anti-epileptic can improve patients with migraine. Okay. EEG and you can find abnormalities on the EEG as well for patients with migraine. And uh, I just need to mention here. We said the migraine is common in children as well. School children, 10%, they have uh, migraine headaches. In children, epilepsy can present as headaches. So it should mm. not be confused as my, as uh, just headaches. So it should be worked out to find out if it is an epilepsy or it's just a headache or migraine. So a presentation of epilepsy can be only headache. Okay. Good and sometimes even in adult patients, when we try to adjust their medications, most of the uncontrolled epilepsy will, will be manifested as uh, continuous headaches. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So definitely, they're probably connected. We don't always have the co we don't always know the connection, but there appears to be some okay. connection between the I two. Think that is. Hala is asking a question: Is ibuprofen safe for pregnancy? Uh, I think during the uh, first, second, first and second trimester, uh, it's contraindicated, right? I'm trying to remember. To my knowledge, uh, use of NSAIDs, I think, can cause it can cause your ductus arteriosus. That is the bridge between your pulmonary artery and the aorta, if I'm not mistaken. It can it can close it off suddenly. So I know that in last trimester we don't use it but in the first and second i'm not sure i i, I tend to avoid uh, NSAIDs throughout pregnancy because sure. we do have better options and we have safer options and with the gi disturbance it's just something i tend to stay away from so most of the analgesics that we advise during pregnancy are paracetamol or acetaminophen codeine as we mentioned they can be used uh yeah but usually we avoid non-steroidal i tend to avoid uh, Again, just any in regards to pregnancy, I tend to avoid NSAIDs as well. Right. Okay. Maurice, Maria Teresa Kunanen has sent the message. Good evening. I have experienced headaches before my cycle, and it seems it's a mild migraine. I have, I have history of migraine attacks. Yet it's not during my period. I'm 36 year old, no other medical problems. What should be the best treatment? So, premenstrual migraines. But she said mild. Mild. Mm -mm. And it's, but it's not during her cycle. She has no medical problems. So, we could, yes. No, no, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, for some, if someone were to come see me in clinic, this mild headaches, theoretically, first of all, it's important to figure out, I guess, what, how frequent are these headaches? If it's just around menses, you could try potentially a long acting triptan, like triptan. You may, you know, to start at the beginning of menses, that may sometimes work. And because it's long acting, if they're more frequent or if you're having psych headaches, not just on your monthly cycle, then you may need to try an abortive therapy or a long or abortive therapy with it, or even a more preventive therapy. But from reading this, theoretically, you could you could be on anything based on what other comorbid conditions or any side effects we're trying to look at a benefit. And if she is receiving any other prophylaxis in other days, you can just double the dose or increase the dual doses during this period. But seeing mild, so most likely you will not need a prophylaxis during this period. As Dr. Ahmed mentioned, only triptans, maybe long acting triptans, or just abortive therapy if needed. Okay, got it. Uh, here is a question from Sally. Is stiffness and soreness in my neck and back related to my stress migraines or cycle? Uh, I think probably both. You can get definitely you can get musculoskeletal neck pain, back pain during migraines, and it's not 
uncommon for women to complain of back pain during their monthly cycle. So I guess the question would be, if you don't have your cycle, do you still have the back pain? Then it's probably more related to your headaches, I would think. Neck pain is quite common in patients with migraine. Yeah. Of I mean, course, you, muscle pain and full body pain can occur during the hormonal changes during menstruation, but neck pain is very common during migraine, and it can be, of course, during, with the stress. So the both answer are, is probably both. Both of them can make headaches. And posture. So now most of us or most of the people they are using their mobiles by bending the neck, and so most of the people they complain now of neck pain and shoulder pains. This is also posture related. Definitely, posture is something that we don't stress, but you know, when you're sitting, you're supposed to be more vertical. You're not supposed to slouch over. You know, it's it's bad habits, but you know, all these little things. It's not, and as you had mentioned, treatment of migraines isn't just sometimes here's a magic pill that's going to make your headaches better. It's medication, lifestyle, how you're living, what you're eating. You know, all of these play a role. Exercise, plenty of water. Good Definitely. night, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Here is a question from Tahir Said. If it is caused by stress, would you would you suggest mindfulness exercise as another option? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Stress have, relief. Yes, pharmacological and non-pharmacological therapy for migraine. So all meditation, any kind of biofeedback or whatever, is also quite helpful. Yoga is important. Yoga has been shown to help. OK. Uh, other people are thanking you for the excellent and interesting presentation. We, we thank you all one by one as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Gerard, do you have any questions? No, you've covered everything, uh, Doctor. Uh, both doctors, Dr. Susan, Dr. Ahmed. You, uh, very nice questions and answers session there. I um, believe all questions were covered thoroughly. So um, I believe, Doctor, you can uh, go ahead and end the. Uh, oh, so I will say, actually, um, this webinar, as always, um, as with previous webinars, will be uploaded. Uh, on Dr. Ameshatila.com, his free website, it will be accessible and free to watch at any time, any place you wish to do so. We will be doing that uh, very shortly, along with other webinars uh, which we have posted recently. This is our last webinar. Uh, we've done many in MS, in headaches, dementia, and pain management. We will be taking a break and we will be back maybe in December for a few small webinars um, before the new year. But you please feel free to visit com in the meantime for uh, all the latest webinars that we'll be posting, uh, which we've backdated. Uh, so thank you from me, and I'll pass you back to Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Susan for the final closing comments. Thank you. Dr. Susan, would you like to say anything, final words? Thank you so much uh, for having me this evening. Uh, I think that was quite uh, educational. I. Uh, the questions were great, they were great, and uh, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for taking yes, your time you. out of your busy schedule to educate us today about this lecture. Uh, Most welcome. I would like to uh, once again thank the audience for attending these webinars. I mean, all said and done, I think this is our 22nd webinar that we have that we have done. All webinars will be uploaded piecemeal, bits and pieces at a time on the website at drahmedshatila.com. As Gerard had mentioned, they're free. Feel free if you ever need to share to any of your friends, colleagues, even to my patients I refer because it's a they're a good source of information. And sometimes as physicians, we don't have that time in office to sit down and educate a person as much as we'd like to. And I think this uh, serves as an important alternative. Uh, I would like to thank our sponsors, Lily today for sponsoring this event, SSMC and Saha for hosting the event, and finally, uh, Gerard from Focus Goal for organizing it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uma
Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you all. Good night.